Perfect. Okay, great. So today we're going to cover all the scary things that you would see because there's less of us, 10 of us. If you want to share your video and audio, we can have more interaction and, and be able to chat through some of these slides and then the rest of your colleagues can watch it online on the channel. Okay, so what we're going to cover today includes visual fields in a bit more detail, how to take a localizing defect, uh, how to examine for visual field localizing defect and also a neurological history. Most of the time you'll be referring because you're worried about the visual fields. We're going to go through some of the more specific conditions, including optic neuritis, papilledema, all the differentials around that. And when papilledema burns up, it can look like optic atrophy, but there are also specific environmental and genetic causes of optic atrophy. We'll look at ocular motility with cranial nerve palsies, the key ones that I think you need to learn about, as well as pupil asymmetry when, you, when it is an emergency. So today's lecture won't cover the giant cell arthritis and the central retinal artery occlusions that we talked a little bit about in lecture number two. But uh, in terms of neurological eye disease, very often they're very closely linked with microvascular disorders. So remember to take your history, check a blood pressure if you have that available in your practice. And, and the GP would need to also cover some of the microvascular uh, workups if there is a clot or something that's causing sudden loss of vision in the eye. So the visual field abnormalities have to be assessed in the context of the rest of the optic nerve functions, including acuity, colour, the actual visualisation of the disc, as well as the pupil movements. Uh, no, you can't hear me. <clears throat> Let me test this again. It's working. Is it still working? You're good to go. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's working now. Yeah, it's working now. Yeah? Okay. So Pratash can't hear it. Um, I've recorded the voice or uh, separately, but it might be difficult to stitch together. Um so should we carry on anyway? Carry on. Um, okay, so in visual fields testing, we want to go a little bit back to the background of visual fields development. So there was static and kinetic pyrometry, and the early devices were like the Goldman device where you have a bowl and a clinician on the other side of the visual field test showing a, a light to the observer and then plotting out the arc, uh, plotting out the the surrounding the surrounding isopters of how wide and how large that visual field is, and this is then correlated with the function of disease. The Emsler grid itself is actually a visual field test. It's testing the central ten degrees, and in patients with more than twelve decibels of visual field loss or significant glaucoma or significant optic nerve disease, an Amsler grid can actually pick out a central visual field defect. So the threshold testing, a lot of you have different visual fields machines in practice. The one we usually use is the Humphreys visual field meter. But the reason I'm telling you about these different thresholds and what it means and what the numbers are, is so that when you look at the printouts and you actually go to your manufacturing um if if you have the manufacturer's guide you can then look at can you record this lecture for me as well mm. oops okay uh so you can look at uh, some of the instructions for how you you look at the numbers and the decibel plots so the full threshold looks at uh four to two decibel staircases it shows the light to the patient at four decibels and continues to show it up and then down to see whether the patient detects that visual field defect or light shown in the eye in the octopus it takes as average of these visual field numbers and we're coming now to the humphreys visual field machines where they use the fast pack and ceta 
So these were the historical developments as these algorithms started being used in practice. And then the CETA one is the one that is commonly used now. The CETA visual field test, uh, it, the background from the fast pack starts with four seed locations where it, start, where it shines the light for patient to see and, and plot the four areas in the visual field. This is why you get a bit of a clover leaf if the patient is not participating correctly in the visual field test. And there are a few markers for you to look at to check the reliability of the visual field test. In order to interpret the difficulties or the, the problems in the visual field, we need to know what normal is. In the CETA algorithm, the one that we use, and the CETA FAST, this plot of the, the decibels that is detected by the patient is compared to a, a normative database based on age and where that visual field location is. So it then gives you a plot. We do the CETA fast and the CETA standard, and it gives you different widths, 24-2 or 30 degrees or the central 10 degrees. For all intents and purposes on the visual fields test, the stimulus is usually a size three compared to the old manual visual field light that is shown inside the eye. Okay, so this is what I was talking about with the clover leaf. So it will start showing you the four points, the patient. And this is typical of somebody falling asleep because these, this is, these are the seed points. And the patient is asked to look at these four points first and then the machine goes out to fill out all of these other places. So normally you'd see numbers of around 30 decibels and that's when they're normal. And then this dense reduces, this number here reduces as you start getting either defects or a patient that's not cooperating. So when doing the visual field test, the technician doing the field test is super critical. It's really important to know whether the patient is responding or paying attention or not. Otherwise you can have false uh, defects that can make you make it very alarming, but actually is a normal patient uh, um, being tested. Now the definition of abnormalities on visual field tests looks for clusters. So you need at least three points where there is a probability map. You can see here the Humphrey visual fields. It's got these different colors and shading. When you have a complete blackout, it means that it's less than 0.5% um, likelihood that that is a false um, plot and that this black spot is likely to be clinically to be significant. So if you have three clusters um, and one of them with very significant probability that it's real and not seen, then that it, it, if you look at the actual raw numbers and three areas are significantly decreased in a pattern, for example, a nasal step for glaucoma, or vertical defects for neuro, then those are, those are significant. For the glaucoma field test, it is also compared from the superior and the inferior field. When the superior and inferior field are markedly different, it often is these uh, wedge defects or fibers across going across. And that's why when there's a comparison and that's abnormal, it's a clinical alert to look again because it might be, some, uh, uh, might be glaucoma. Okay, so those are what you would commonly see. So this patient here is one of the people I referred to the neurologist uh, because he had a history of headaches. He'd come from the community. And actually by the time we saw him at um, probably 10 weeks after the referral, um, he had marked, marked papilledema. Now papilledema will give you a visual field defect in quite a lot of the cases and where it is in the brain can be tracked by this sort of a diagram that is quite easily available. If it is just the optic nerve and just the one side, but it's internal to the eye. For example, a arterial occlusion like the non-arteritic uh, anterior ischemic optic neuropathy, then you would get this visual field defect like D where you have just one bit, one half, in monocularly, then you might think that problem is inside of the eye. Once it starts going along the fibers and the chiasm and the optic nerve tract going into the brain, then something that is pressing inside the brain 
can cause, in this case, the right eye of this patient has an enlarged blind spot, a, a significant one, and in the other side, a defect uh, that is pressing, and in this case, an inferior defect. He actually had a brainstem tumor and, and, and needed surgery almost urgently, and we sent him to King's within, within a day. So if these fibers, you follow the fibers, the nasal and the temporal, nasal and temporal for the two eyes, they cross at this thing called the chiasm. Um, the, I, can, I can voice over it or for Pritesh, I can either voice over it or I've, I'm, I'm actually recording the voice of this lecture so we can put them up. Um, windows. I'm afraid I'm on a Mac so I can't do the recording on here. It's okay. I'll, I'll do a voiceover of this lecture and then we can put it up. Okay. So then uh, when we have this where it's congruent and homonymous, meaning it's the same in the two sides, it tends to be fibers that have already crossed after the chiasm. And almost all of these are generally related to strokes when you see homonymous defects. Okay. So that's just an introduction to looking at the fields. A window in the top left. Pro top left, press record. Mm, not seeing it. Sorry, technical technical issues today. So localizing visual field defects, you want to look at age, go through the normal history taking with the presenting complaints. Specifically, you know, you want to think about the lecture we had last week about ischemic and inflammatory conditions because they can have neurological signs and microvascular disease. And then with medications, specifically, we're thinking whether there's TB medications, ifambutol and isoniazid give you optic nerve, um, optic neuropathies, uh, phenytoin, lithium, and other things that might be specifically related like corticosteroids and the pill for benign intracranial hypertension. Okay, so taking a full history as usual, and then taking specifically of the social and occupational history as we go through the other specific conditions, you might then see why uh, it's important that the social history actually is in part of the management plan sometimes um, for things such as nutritional optic neuropathy, where they're just lacking the vitamins for the eye to function properly. Then the neurological signs, you will do a cranial nerve examination, but cranial nerve eight is hearing and tinnitus. So you might want to do that and ask about that um, as part of the history taking for a neurological query. Balance issues, other nutrition and bowel issues, and then infectious diseases as well. Okay, and then rashes and joint pains and things like autoimmune conditions can, can lead to neuro neurological clinical signs um, because of the inflammatory component. So another one of the systems reviews. Okay, so we're going to do optic neuritis first because that's one that even though it's quite devastating at the time when you diagnose it or you suspect it, the recovery rate is actually pretty good for most patients. Multiple sclerosis is an inflammatory demyelinating pre uh, disorder. Here is a sort of pictogram of a full body um, illustration of it. What happens is the myelin sheath around the actual neuron becomes inflamed and, and sheds. And that then gives you a defect and a neurological problem. And that can occur anywhere in the spinal cord, in the swallowing, in the urinary tract. And that's why some of these MS patients are wheelchair bound and have severe debilitating um, effects from the demyelinating illness. The ophthalmologist or the optometrist may be the very first person to pick up something like this because optic neuritis often appears as the presenting complaint, presenting presentation of multiple sclerosis. Often the patients are between the age of 20 to 50 years old. They will come in with optic nerve signs. Okay, it, um, it, it's, uh, it, it is possible to have 6 6 vision and have MS, but there would be other clinical signs. There would be the typical pain on eye movements, like this, pain on retrobulbar pain on eye movements, loss of red color, loss of contrast sensitivity, potentially flashing lights. 
Sometimes you have normal disc appearances, but there will be visual field defects as well. So, and, and you'd have a, a female patient in the correct age group. And um, usually the acuity is diminished at the time of presentation. Okay. Now the optic neuritis treatment trial is the most famous trial and the one that we, we do our clinical treatments on. Um, it recruited unilateral patients with optic neuritis that, had, that were symptomatic for less than eight days. They all had an RAPD okay, and a visual field defect. So you can see here, even if you have 6-6 and you pick up an RAPD, it's so important that you know how to do this clinical examination well um, in order to pick up a small change in, in an abnormal pupil and take a very good clinical history. Most of the patients started having a rapid recovery within a month in all treatment arms. And the treatment was either oral prednisolone or intravenous steroids, okay? So we do give intravenous methylprednisolone, particularly if, for example, patient develops optic neuritis in their non-amblyopic eye, so in their better seeing eye, and they were a young mom or working or um, for, for their function, they need to get back to their recovery quicker, then it is not unreasonable to give the intravenous methylprednisolone. Most patients are referred for that to be considered anyway. But even if they didn't get treatment or they opted not to have treatment because high, high dose steroids or steroids can give you lots of side effects, nightmares, um, um, blood sugars, blood pressure problems, etc., they still do pretty well. The worse the initial presentation, the worse the likelihood of the clinical outcome in terms of vision. So do look out for these and and they then need to be referred into a unit where they can have MRI imaging because you want to know if their risk of multiple sclerosis is present. If there are more than one brain lesion seen when, when they are imaged, then um, they are more likely to have a more systemic demyelinating illness. And then we'll come to the swollen optic discs. This is something that always gains a lot of interest. I, I know you had one of your peer group teachings with the Mm. Um, with one of the charities um, um, talk, talking about papilledema and it's always good to go through it again. Swollen optic discs can be in one eye or two eyes. If you take this summary slide and what I talked about last week about going through the different mechanisms like inflammatory, tumour, toxicity, hereditary, if you go through the different ways something can cause disease you generally can try and work out what is most likely for that patient that is sitting in front of you. If it is bilateral, then it's more likely to be systemic. Like the case that I showed you with the visual field earlier, um, you, you want to exclude a space-occupying lesion. If the patient is unwell, you want to exclude things like systemic infections, meningitis. Um, they, could be, um, they could be someone with malignant hypertension and also some of their medications or being morbidly obese can be contributing to this higher pressure inside the brain. Swollen optic discs happen because the eye pressure is low and the nerve behind it, the intracranial pressure is actually pressing quite a lot more significantly and pushing the lamina cribosa and all the tissues forward and you start seeing edema. So it's the edema that we're looking for. So if we know what we're looking for, then you can get your OCTs and you'll get your clinical examinations and also worry a little bit less about uh, something um, that might not be serious, okay? The frizzing grading of papilledema is what is clinically used. And talking to my neuro, neuro ophthalmology colleagues at St. Thomas's, at this stage, they want to see everybody who is frizzing three and above. It's likely to be like that going forwards as well, um, once COVID returns back to normal. The very early papilledema cases may or may not be there. So it's really quite useful to have two sets of clinical examinations. So if you're only picking out very early papilledema, the, the thing to do is to chart your progression, I chart all the five functions of the optic nerve and take a good clinical history, 
take your photograph of the optic disc, do your visual field test, do your OCT scan, do everything and come back in four weeks and compare. If things are worse, that's the point you call casualty. Okay. If you've got significant edema, you call casualty the same day. If it's very early and perhaps the clinical signs are not showing anything, maybe a visual field defect and you're not very sure if it's an artifact or not, you repeat it at four weeks and then if it's worse, you call casualty. That point where you suspect stage one, stage two papilledema, you make the referral already on ERS. You can put urgent, but um, even some of our urgent cases can get delayed like that patient that I saw actually got seen at 10 weeks you, sometimes it's up to more than four months and it could be up to six months when we reopen again but make the referral first on ERS so if you then on your second visit find that they are worse we bring it forward and they, they get then seen straight with the neuro ophthalmology team and we've got sort of progressive um, clinical information to go on so I'm going to show you the pictures of what they look like uh, what the what the papilledema does is cause like the, the name edema fluid swelling in the nerve fiber layer so what you're staring at is actually the blood vessels so when you can see blood vessel obscurations if the swelling or the worry is around here just around the outside of the disc can i maybe i can draw it here can you see the rim of the disc so if the swelling is around here, but you're not seeing any changes in the optic nerve, okay, so this is grade two or less. Yeah, this is likely to be grade two because you can maybe a little bit here where um, there's a mild obscuration, but here, can you see that it's swollen? There is this kind of, this appearance of it being like that. Yeah, and on the optic nerve head, this is a scan from a textbook, an excellent textbook, um, uh, full of full of clinical photographs, and this is frank papilledema that needs to be seen the same day. Okay, perhaps in IIH they won't get treated or managed the same day, but because of the significant impact on the vision and even with IIH to get severe symptoms, it would be reasonable if you see something like this, that they go to hospital the very same day. So that's your cutoff. But then, let me get the next slide. Uh, IT issues today, I'm so sorry. Next slide, please. Here we go. Here we go. So in contrast, we're talking about early papilledema. When papilledema first starts, it starts in the superior and inferior. Can you see here? Here and here. Okay. So when you're seeing them here, uh, nasal and temporal, maybe maybe not have a few more things to support your worry or your confirmation this is progression in a darker skin gentleman and you can see the, in the very early stage you can just about see that there might be some nerve swelling there which is why your high resolution color photograph and your high resolution color photograph repeated is what's going to make you the diagnosis and and get it accurate for you when it's just very early signs maybe just a bit of headache absolutely nothing else and then in four weeks they've got headache more nausea and a change in your clinical details then you know that this is early papilledema that's progressing okay and you see here there's a nerve fiber layer hemorrhage as well and it's a little bit further than what you would see in glaucoma where it might be just here at the lamina cribosa junction that's because the fluid is swelling all around here that's the fluid swelling and that's the rim of the disc margin Okay, and what you're really interested in is actually looking at all of these blood vessels and seeing are there any obscurations. So in a normal optic disc, when you look in and you can see the veins pulsating, that's not papilledema. Okay, it will not pulsate if the intracranial pressure is higher than the eye pressure. So when you record SVP, spontaneous venous pulsations, it doesn't help if it's disappeared um, but it helps if we knew it was there and then it disappeared 
So again, with the early ones and you're not sure, you look for Venus pulsations. If you see the Venus pulsations, then that's a reassuring sign for you. And also if you have that clinically recorded and then at some point that disappears and someone clearly says no SVP seen with a hemorrhage and blurred disc margin superiorly and inferiorly, query early papilledema. Can you see your, your repeated clinical examination is actually what gives you more specificity in early disease. And then everything's just taking a little while to load to the next slide. I will click five seconds early next time. There we go. Have any of you made referrals for swollen optic discs that have come back as brain tumors and things like that? Any experience? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's it's sight saving and life saving, isn't it? Life saving. Okay, so when you get frank papilledema, then then those structures are not even visible. Okay, and the OCT scan shows the swelling and the edema at the optic nerve head, and you see this triangle triangular sign. Yeah, if it's drusen, it's deep, often much deeper. If it's swelling you'll get this on your OCT. So you've got lots of things to support you. All your clinical examination, the color vision testing, your color photographs for good documentation. So you shouldn't really be fearful and actually be um, quite proud to be part of a team that can save sight, save lives, save sight. And when you get to this kind of frank papilledema, uh, all, the, all the structures are obscured, even the more peripheral capillaries are all distended and dilated. You can't see the front surface of the, um, of the, yeah, yeah, of the um, contour of the disc together with the rims, etc. Yep which is why accurate clinical examination is really important. And if we can pick them out in uh, asymptomatic, even with the asymptomatic cases, when you do the blood workup and when you do the further investigations, things then become clear why they have not been right for a while. They might not have uh, visual symptoms or they might not be complaining, but it would not be unusual for patients that did have frank papilledema, something's not right with their general health, okay? So they, they wouldn't be functioning to their own key daily best capacity. Yes, okay, so the obese patient has uh, have a very specific condition, IIH, and that is a very common condition. So a couple of patients, papilledema, no cause found after lumbar punk, uh, after blood tests and investigations, and this could be benign intracranial hypertension. That was the old name, but it's not benign because the patients are very symptomatic. They have a swishing noise in their ear and tinnitus and nausea in the mornings, etc. I'm trying to move on the slide and it's stuck. <laughs> so my next slide is showing idiopathic intracranial hypertension. Mm. When it comes through. Here we go. So before in uh, um, idiopathic intracranial hypertension, I just want to show you dystrusen. Now that you've seen a few of the textbook photographs of papilledema, the difference between papilledema and dystrusen are that your blood vessels are very clearly visible. They tend to be more, they tend to be superficial, um, but still deeper than the vessels or buried that's completely not visible. Everything looks a little bit uh, what we call swollen or blurred under this margin here. You can see this one is a 13 year old girl and this is the mum. And the blood vessels have this, which is the trifurcation of the blood vessels because the, the vessels have got this bump of hyaline material, like a calcified plaque of drusen deeper within, so the blood vessels split into three. And that's quite common. And you also get this kind of a bumpy appearance. And remember we said superior and inferior are dangerous with papilledema. 
For this, you can often see it on the side, on the peripapillary atrophy area when you examine it. And you see these little, little bumps. I think Drusen came from a German name that said tiny yellow spots. Um, sometimes taking a clinical photograph makes it clearer to see. And also you can do that on OCT scans. And it then shows you the deeper layers and you can see isolated blobs like this. It is not uncommon to find drusen with other conditions. You can see that in a glaucoma patient, you can see that in AMD patients or retinitis pigmentosa as well. Those are all, those are all clinical conditions that I have regularly spotted drusen on patients. And you would do an OCT scan and if the scan machine that you have available allows you to do autofluorescence, then you see this glow or this shiny spot up here that might tell you that it's drusen. Okay, this is the red free and this is the autofluorescence and it's much deeper compared to the V-shaped edema, the triangular edema that you get from papal edema. Everything is always looked at in context with the fields, color, acuity and the pupil examination. Um, the big scary thing is looking for brain tumours and they can be meningiomas, gliomas. Gliomas may be related to neurofibromatosis. They can have pituitary adenomas um, and those people can have, um, um, can be acromegalic, tall, large and bitemporal visual field defects. So those are things that would get picked up. Those are things that regular get seen and are regular contribution from the ophthalmologist to the, um, to the medics um, in, in life-saving conditions. There will be ophthalmic signs. You can ask on their history of headaches and vomiting, early morning vomiting, and they all need imaging in order to to check and refute this and so they have to be sent to tertiary centers. Um, we're lucky Kings and St. Thomas are both excellent units for this. So CT, MRI imaging and they will be led to the, the correct people and the neurosurgical team at Kings is world class. Okay, so um, I've had a few that have been that have been referred for neurosurgery and then you come to the ones so you'd have the papilledema you have distrusion. I'm going by severity and then frequency. You can get this. If you look for it, you'll see quite a lot of distrusion. If you if you saw it in community and you're sure it's distrusion, it's showing up in the autofluorescence and there's no visual field defect. Then and the patient's totally asymptomatic. A drusen can be followed up in the community without being referred. A very small proportion, maybe less than 5% would have a field defect and then less than 1% will have a progressive visual field defect. So those are the sorts of numbers to think about when you're thinking rationing services, which ones we need to send into hospital. It also depends very much on your own knowledge and your own confidence and also the, the, the support and backup that you have. You, you know that you can always email us a photograph. So it shouldn't be scary for you to say, okay, I'll see this patient again in four months time because I haven't found anything. But in the meantime, I'll send a photograph. You know, we're never going to mind doing that and, and that upskills everybody, which is great. The thing that we finally find when we go through all the tests and often no other causes found, like um, um, Shanas Krashi just pointed out, that obese patients, often female, can have something called idiopathic intracranial hypertension. This is my colleague Sui Wong and you see her um, holding up a red pin. So even on the bad side, even if you didn't have a visual field device or machine, you can do a visual field using a red pin to look at the peripheral of your visual field um, uh, score. And idiopathic intracranial hypertension happens when too much of the CSF fluid is built up and usually from excessive weight Patients may be on steroids or have hormonal issues and be on the contraceptive pill. They can have diplopia, headaches, and they're on long-term treatments. And there is an entire clinic of IIH patients that are seen long-term. So they then also get monitored with the visual field, with the OCT, and um, the macular plane OCT scan, so that you can look at each layer, not the enhanced depth, the macular OCT. Uh, all of these things are increasingly becoming available in the community. 
So you may see a patient who is known to have IIH and comes to you for a different problem. Okay, in those cases, just check where they've been looked after so that you don't go sending them from Kings to Tommy's or somewhere where they've already had LPs and already part of the service or in Lewisham. So we don't duplicate all the services of, um, of the investigations. So when somebody is obese, then, <clears throat> then the general circulation is, the circulation is compromised. Okay, so the intracranial pressure is high. Okay, such going in, that intracranial pressure is actually a fluid uh, cushion all around the white matter, all, all around the brain, all around the spinal cord and going right down. That's why at the base of the spine where they do the lumbar puncture, okay, measures the pressure. Uh, measures the opening pressure okay because all of it is an enclosed system of fluid that's supporting the brain yep so obesity as well as the steroid component has got a pathway where steroids are generated into other hormones okay the body needs steroids the body needs steroids to function and the steroids then cause other hormonal imbalances. So all of this then dis disrupts the homeostasis, homeostasis of the, of the homeostasis of the circulation of this protective brain fluid. And then it becomes higher than a normal person and, and it shows up in the eye. Okay. So that's the IIH and great. And when you see disc squelling and you think it's IIH, then it's still a diagnosis of exclusion. So they would still need CT imaging. And with the IIH, you need to know the opening, pump, opening pressure on the lumbar puncture. So if it's frank and significant papilledema, then you should still refer. If it's not, then you do two, two sets of clinical examinations and refer. And if for some reason the hospital is going on and on and we cannot see them for four months or whatsoever, it's, it's reasonable for you to see, see them for weekly and send in their clinical information if, you, if there's resources um, and ability to do so. Okay, so that covers our disc swellings. Uh, I've, I've, for each of these sections, I've targeted the key and the dangerous or the treatable or reassuring the common things so that if you cover these you would have you would have the ability to fill in the gaps and look up things or ask if they are not in the usual category of very common or very serious okay now when papilledema completely burns out it could look like optic atrophy on this color photograph here is again from that nice textbook i told you about um, which is the eye with the optic atrophy can anyone tell me this color photograph on the bottom left do you think that this one has atrophy or this or this one Okay, the image on the left, but it's the right eye. Yeah? Okay, so it's looking at the color, the contour, and the pallor. Exactly. So when you have this light, it's like pale area, and it's uniocular, um, you can, you, you would still go through all these specific tests, vision, color, follow up, look for change, etc and take a full neurological history, full drug history and environmental history because if all the other things have been excluded it could be a genetic cause of optic neuropathy or an environmental cause. With the environmental causes it's going to be drugs or nutrition specifically. So on the same day that I referred that patient with the brain stand tumour I had also this patient come into my, the same, my clinic and um, this here can you see respects the midline the vertical midline. So when things respect the vertical midline, it makes you think neurological. Okay. 
so regardless of the visual field machines you have, if everything is just on one side, it could be the same, but across the side, that could be a stroke, like I said, or on the outside. So in this case, they needed a pituitary workup as well. Um, firstly, the imaging first, and then they brought them back to do the test. And in the end, it was found that she just had a hereditary optic neuropathy um, and it wasn't pituitary. But uh, these are the types of visual fields that, that need to be seen in hospital. Autosomal dominant optic atrophy is a condition that that possibly has a positive genetic test uh, with the OP OPA1 gene. There may be other genetic causes of it, but optic optic OD, ODOA, there is a recessive form as well, and this is rare. Usually, you're going to have moderate visual loss. Usually, there is a color deficit. So usually, when you're picking up, there's an optic nerve dysfunction, and it's not swollen, you'll see that it's pale, or there's something else that makes you think uh, this does not look right and needs to be examined. More than when you have five tests of the optic nerve function, you'll find that two or three of them would be abnormal, okay, for optic atrophy type conditions. So in these cases, you refer them in for further investigations. You can give them some, um, some lifestyle advice, for example, smoking and alcohol, because we know that having malnutrition makes this optic nerve disease worse. You can tell them those things. And if they present to you and, and there's a strong family history and they already know that they have dominant optic atrophy and they've come to you for something else like a dry eye or cataracts, you know, um, uh, you, you make the relevant referrals or significantly declined enough, like 15% of them will have visual acuity of less than 660. And um, they're young and these patients would probably already know that they have this condition because it's diagnosed um, in young working age people. And in a proportion of these cases, they have sensory hearing loss as well. So in Southeast London, we've, we're quite lucky to have multiple charities that are very pro low vision and pro multiple sensory loss. I think that was all the work from my predecessor, Sarah Janequin. So that's, that's always worth asking when somebody has severe vision loss, whether they have also hearing loss. This could be age related, but this really cuts them out from the rest of the world and important to get the other support structures in place so that um, they, they can try to live a full life. Now, Leber's hereditary optic neuropathy, as opposed to the other ADOA, is a mitochondrial optic neuropathy. It's transmitted. Um, the maternal line mitochondria transmits down and the males can't cope with it so well. So you find that the clinical features and the presentations show up more in the men than the women. So you get a central loss of your vision and by 50 years of age, majority of them would have shown their signs and symptoms or have had some decline in their vision as a result of Leber's. They'll have a central scotoma, uh, they'll have color deficits, you'll see the optic atrophy. You look for defects and you look for... So all of the five things of optic nerve function tend to be affected to some degree. To diagnose and confirm this, um, you would need genetic testing. It's done in Oxford, Newcastle, some of these centers. And, and they may have m muscle tissues because the mitochondria is like the energy cell in your body. So if you have mitochondrial disease, there might be tissue, soft cardiac tissue problems or muscular weaknesses. And bearing in mind that these are often working age young men and might not have had symptomatic and then lose a significant proportion of their sight. It's quite useful to link them up with research and support facilities. This is the Leber's Hereditary Optic Neuropathy Society and it lists all the different drugs and the genetic testings and all the research that that is being made available for these patients and you would then refer them um, I mean firstly to a, your tertiary unit like ourselves and then if they need to go on to Newcastle or have blood sent to Oxford, that can be coordinated. So these uh, LHON would be more rare. It would be rare. I've probably only diagnosed two in my career so far. Um, and but when you see it, you've picked up you've picked up something 
that changes the course of the management for the patient. Toxic amblyopia and nutritional are associated with a different socioeconomic class altogether. They tend to be uh, in patients who might be homeless or who might be strict vegans or don't get, get out for any sun. So they're low on vitamin D and they're low on vitamin B, copper, E, all of these and can be multifactorial. And in the hospital setting, we would still check for all, we should, we would still check for um, other causes and possibly do a brain scan to look at, to look and ensure that there's not something pressing on the eye that has the, the atrophic signs. And the treatment and management is to alleviate the malabsorption issues, really. They, they could have another systemic illness. They could have a GI tract, um, a, um, a gastroenterological disorder that's making the absorption difficult. And for us, yes, it is reversible. Um, not all, not always. It depends on how severe it has been and how toxic the actual agent was. So it used to be called um, tobacco, to, uh, to, uh, smoke smoking tobacco and uh, you you might get some asymmetry, but usually you'd you'd see it bilateral. Yep, often there would be signs in both eyes, and for this I've also le left you here the medical eye unit. Um, if patients are known, and then and then we follow them up, and it can take a long while before they start seeing a difference in their vision, because once you've damaged or sort of hurt the optic nerve and have some atrophic signs takes a very long time to recover and these are very deep seated issues in terms of getting people to come off smoking and alcohol and being homeless it's an entire change of all they've ever known so a supportive clinical team and hospital team makes a big difference for these nutritional diseases so this this neuro eye lecture is quite heavy the topic are you guys still okay <laughs> i know there's only 10 of you here um and and i'll upload for the rest of the good i'll upload for 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 the rest of the team we'll, we'll put up the slides and i think i've worked out how to voice over a powerpoint as well so it may be possible to distribute the powerpoint with a voice over let's see let's get you guys uh, understanding and then you can tell the colleagues that you work with and then there's a a, a cumulative effect so the next one we're going to talk about is cranial nerve palsies yeah so which cranial nerve is affected in this cartoon up here can anyone say left eye is normal the right eye is turning out turning down and we're lifting up the eyelid this is one not to miss which cranial nerve is affected now yeah perfect okay Cranial nerve palsies always ask about trauma. Yep. And, and in fact, in your clinical optometric practice, always ask about trauma because trauma can give you cataract, trauma can give you all sorts of things that should be part of your standard uh, making. And this is a table of all the optic nerve functions. Can you see that you've just by being ophthalmic practitioners, we've hit half of all the cranial nerve functions just by looking at the eyes. Isn't that cool? See here. Um, I would like to show you something. I'll see if I can add it here. There's a very cute video on Twitter. Uh, let me see. Of, um, let me see if I can find a video. It's 1.6 megabytes, so... Oh, it's a video. I can't share a video on a video of this. Anyway, I'll ask, I'll ask, um, uh, I'll forward it to Pratesh on a WhatsApp and then you can see it. So the, the video consults that you've been doing, you actually can do a lot of this uh, ocular motility testing. So we're going to start with optic nerve. We've covered a lot of ocular motor nerve does a fair bit of the eye examination. Okay, so now I'm going to move my eyes. I don't know if you can see me in full. Let me just take this off for a moment. Yeah, and you can see me on your screen. Can you see a bigger version of me on your screen? 
Yeah? Okay, we're going to do my ocular motility. Okay? So, um, I can see Mohammed there. Mohammed, do you want to talk? Mahmoud, Mahmoud, do you want to talk to me and ask me yeah. to move my eyes? Okay, so yeah. which muscle, which which nerve is moving this eye out there? So looking just horizontal, lateral rectus is sixth nerve. Okay, so so your first thing you're moving me out and then. Okay, so you have to do the whole thing. So you got to do both. Okay, so you were absolutely spot on when you do eye movements. You have to do both. Okay, and right, and then up. So there's a reason we do the horizontals first, and then you look up. So you're looking up. What do you notice? My eyes are still straight, right? Because I did this test yesterday and I can see. Yeah? So up here, we're doing superior rectus. There's a bit of inferior oblique, but both of this is superior rectus mostly. That way is this medial rectus and that's lateral rectus. And then, and then we're going to come down. Okay? So when you do going up, and going down, you might see an A or a V pattern. Have you seen that before? Yeah, always. Yeah. So when you're getting the patient to look up, so I'm look. It's like a H for me, isn't it? When I look up, it goes left, right, up, and then down. And then the other thing that follows when we do eye movements is the eyelid actually does something. Yeah. Yeah, so you're actually looking and the eyelid is being lifted because the third nerve supplies a little bit of the eyelid. Okay, so not only does the third nerve do the medial rectus, it does the inferior rectus, it, is, it does the inferior obliques, uh, it does the inferior obliques going up. And, you know, so the third nerve does most of that, including the eyelid. Okay, which is why when you have an eye movement disorder, that is affecting your eyelid that means it's more serious okay but i'll go through the key ones so the actual way you do your ocular motility testing ideally with a red pin like sui wong was doing and you can create one for yourselves and then you do it left to right and then when you're at the extreme you do a cover test you know like looking for a squint because if that lateral rectus can move a little bit more it will move more Okay, so when I look that way, it's my left lateral rectus. When I put that way, it's my right lateral rectus. So the first thing you're checking and excluding is sixth nerve. Yeah, the sixth nerve is horizontal. And you think, okay, six is fine. And then when you're looking up, you know you're looking for your third nerve because you're looking up for most of their functions, superior rectus, yeah, and inferior oblique, and you're looking at the eyelids. So if they're going like this, or they have like myasthenia gravis or something, and their eyelids are, um, um, have have a change, you might see it on looking up very carefully, and then looking back down. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to put the slides back on again. And where did we get to? We got to. Um, Oh dear, okay. Yeah. Um, slides of ocular motility like this. Okay, so um, up to before COVID, not many people talked about smell tests, but now you guys know what anosmia is, isn't it? So the loss of smell <laughs> has suddenly been never used to check the, the olfactory system. I, I, I was going to do a research project and the test of smell can take 45 minutes to do. <laughs> so we don't do this formally and we just ask patients whether they've lost their smell and people are more alert to it because COVID symptoms, uh, this is one of the symptoms that has now been reported. So you check your optic nerve as usual, you check horizontal first and then up and then superior oblique goes down and in. Okay, so that's the trochlear nerve in torsion and down gaze and then uh trigeminal nerve gives you um sensations so when you have things like herpes simplex keratitis then v1 that supplies the cornea you might have poor blink and you might have um 
sorry, not blink. The blink is actually seventh nerve. The V1 gives you the corneal sensation and then V2, facial sensation and down here. So the fifth nerve, if there's a corneal ulcer or if you're suspecting herpes simplex, you should check for corneal sensation with the tip of a cotton or tissue bud. But the main thing about cranial nerve function is that just by doing ocular motility, you're seeing two, you're seeing cranial nerve four, you're seeing cranial nerve six, and then when you get the patient to close their eyes really tight or open again or look at their eyelids, you're also looking at the ocular motor nerve and the things around the face, okay? So for the rest of the cranial nerve examination, we then check for facial, facial muscles, the, the squeezing really hard and then blowing out your cheek like that. That's your facial nerve there. Okay, and then hearing, you do a sort of uh, put this next to your ear and see if the patient can hear it. You put it out of their sight and then you, you do this rubbing of your fingertips and ask if the patient can hear it. So those are sort of the, the bedside things that lets you cover all your cranial nerves to to seven, six, maybe seven, if you do the cheeks, and then eight as well, because we know that some of these optic neuropathies have an impact on hearing imbalance. So it's just a simple extension after you've done the motility to put round the ear of the patient and just check their hearing, whether very grossly they, they feel the same in the two eyes, or it prompts them to tell you, yeah, actually I had hearing loss in this eye from trauma, in this ear from trauma or whatever. The rest of it, cranial nerves 9, 10, 11, 12, etc., are lower down, glossopharyngeal, looking, we look inside, you look at the uvula and, and then you get them to shoulder shrug and then you get to push, push, the, push the muscles across. So 7 to 12 doesn't really give you a lot more information in terms of neuro eye conditions. The focus is doing your ocular motility quite well. Okay, so... Which nerve supplies? We've told you the answers already. Um, shall I just give it to you, the answer? Like this. Did you get it right? Or can you remember? Yeah? So lateral rectus is out. Inferior oblique can't go down the stairs. Uh, sorry, superior oblique can't go down the stairs. Okay, so if you have those two, the rest are optic nerve three. Is that clear? Yeah, in terms of function. Superior rectus, inferior rectus, all the things that we talked about when you, you had me on your big screen, that mostly is the oculomotor nerve. Okay, oculomotor nerve, the actual nucleus for the oculomotor nerve is huge. And inside of the oculomotor nerve has got the sympathetic and parasympathetic supply, which is why the third nerve is extremely important. Okay, for the eyes as well as the brain. Now, then, uh, this is the funny video that I wanted to show you. Uh, I'll send it to Pratesh. And when we do horizontal first, do your cover test, and you do your vertical, do your cover test, sometimes you'll see in orthoptic reports, those of you who work in the hospitals, you might see the orthoptist say there's a V pattern or there's an A pattern. That's just saying when you look up, the eye is going out like that. And then you look down, it's going like that. It's just the balance of the muscles. Um, so in up gaze, if lateral rectus is, is stronger, then it's going a V pattern and medial, medial rectus stronger. Then it's more important in terms of the strabismus, or the strabismus management that they, they see these patterns, etc. And all of that is your orthoptic, orthoptic assessment. And I'm, and I'm sharing that because don't forget the orthoptists. So if you're picking up a neurological type thing, or you're picking up a diploplia problem or a cranial nerve problem, when you make the referral, often indicate this patient will be helped by having an orthoptic assessment. That way, whoever sees the referral letter either makes a joint appointment with orthoptics or sends them directly to the strabismus clinic because they too can send all the neural eye things on. Okay, so it's just to remind you that ocular motility itself is another subspecialty um, within ophthalmology of orthoptics. Now, 
Uh, I want to spend a little bit of time. Uh, oh, uh, we did the left, right, up and down. But when you have the patient in up gaze, you're observing the eyelids. You're also observing the height of the eyelid. Okay. And that will come when we talk about the actual cranial nerve four. Yeah. When you're looking up and there is a nystagmus, that's why you do this left, right, up, down quite slowly. When you do um, uh, in extreme gaze, you might see a small beat going to the side. And that's and beat nystagmus and that's normal that's okay if you're getting them to look up and down and the eye starts to beat and you're starting to see a sort of nystagmus pattern vertically those need to be referred urgently okay that's not normal and and that's uh that that needs um a workup and possibly a brain scan because vertical nystagmus shouldn't uh, shouldn't be part of your normal eye examination Third nerve posies, I've spent so much time talking about how important the third nerve is, is because you could save somebody's life if you picked up a third nerve posy. Okay, I had one from eye casualty when I was ST4 perhaps and went straight to UCLH and they had an impending aneurysm that was about to, to burst. And it could be a painful third, that's not big ignored, because that could be sight threatening, life threatening. They will have a sudden headache. They might even have neurological signs already or poor responsiveness and drowsiness. If your third nerve palsy is associated with a dilated pupil, it means it's deeper in the brain, doesn't it? Because the sympathetic supply of that third nerve is being affected. So if you see a blown up pupil, you see this cartoon, um, you send them straight to the biggest um, emergency neuro unit that you can find, UCLH, St. Thomas's Kings, basically. Okay, because these guys are at high risk and they'll need a CT or MR angiogram to exclude an aneurysm. Okay, that's pressing on the ciliary, on the third nerve nucleus inside the brain. Well, other third nerve palsies that haven't affected the sympathetic supply, meaning the eye is down, out slightly, but the pupil is normal. In the case where you have a third nerve palsy and the pupil is normal, then, um, then it could be microvascular, it could be diabetes, it could be a more simple um, reason for one part of the third nerve to not be functioning so well. In those cases, um, usually they would already have been known to have this. And it's very difficult to recover full binocularity if, if there's been a, a significant clinical reason for a third nerve palsy. So they often need prisms or even surgery or are under long-standing care at the hospital because this really disrupts with your balance when you've got constant diplopia. The eyes are actually working, they can see, but the eyes are in completely wrong directions because most of the muscles in the affected eye are not working. Okay, in these long-term cases, they might be coming to you for their spectacle fits, etc. Um, and then the prisms become important to try and straighten them as much as possible. And then uh, we do the strabismus surgery first, and then we do the lid surgery to lift it up. So the team at St. Thomas's will be Chris Hammond, Elsa Ritchie, VJ, and Susie Morley. So third nerve, super important, potentially life-saving, and look for the lid and look for the pupil. Okay, and then, and then fourth nerve palsy, I was telling you to look for the eye that is higher. The eye which is slightly higher is often the eye that is abnormal. So there's a Bichowski hilt, uh, hilt head tilt test. So when the eye is high, when you look up gaze like this gentleman here, and the right eye is higher than the left eye. If that's the case, the place where you're noticing the higher up eye, you tilt the head. Because if it's already higher and you're bringing it down, it's going to make the patient's symptoms worse. Can you understand that? Yeah? Kind of easy to follow. You go left, right first, and then you go up. And when you go up and you see that one eye is higher, you move the head. And then they go, whoa, that's not very nice. Oh, I don't like that. 
that's probably the first part of your abnormal cranial nerve fall examination and then you get them to look um in the look down and in because now you're thinking oh this could be so4 which is superior oblique supplied by the fourth nerve and you can see now that the and the extreme other side and when when he's looking this patient here his abnormality is in the right eye and when he's looking at the extreme left the right eye is still higher and it's most prominently higher okay so that's a superior oblique palsy almost always trauma in an older person it could be congenital and it could also be microvascular if it's microvascular it's just an ischemia to a very tiny thin nerve usually within six to eight weeks they get better conservative treatment uh fourth nerve palsies uh, don't get that scary uh oh no something major is happening um but they could have constant diplopia and if this is long standing for quite a while then you could consider surgery for them Okay, so it's worse on opposite gaze and worse on the tilt of the higher eye. And that's how you check for a fourth nerve palsy. And you look in under nine quadrants as usual. And then the six is the one I talked right about, right in the beginning about. Because the very first thing you're doing when your eye movements testing is looking for six nerve palsy. Yeah, if you can't go out and you can't go out and that's abnormal, then that's... Um, that that could be two things the first is the simpler one in green which is an ischemic or microvascular like a diabetic six palsy and they get better on their own usually they get just need a little bit of a supportive treatment prisms to straighten for a little while and then they they get better the other ones are the brain because the sixth nerve has a very long course it goes a long way inside the covers and sinus and round the side and so if there's any pressure that's building up inside the brain, for example, that obese person with the uh, increased intracranial hypertension, it's possible that their diplopia is due to a sixth nerve palsy. Okay? The diplopia is due to the sixth nerve being affected or being slightly squished because of the high intracranial pressure. So when you see a sixth nerve palsy, you also have to think, is this a localizing sign is this a false localizing sign and should i be thinking of a aneurysm or subarachnoid or a, a stroke or a av malformation so six nerve palsy you want to be very good in your clinical history taking and if there is a concern send them up because you might be worried about a space occupying lesion okay when they become long-standing then they get botox injections or surgery just to straighten for the double vision um, but those are the two things for six. So you only really need to learn three, four, and six and learn the patterns. Yeah, just like the learn papilledema, learn IIH, learn Drusen. If you get these top threes always correct, then you're doing really well. Okay. And then the last part of the talk is three or four slides on pupil asymmetry. And this table here is how I tend to document my clinical findings for pupil problems. People like to refer asymmetric pupils and anisocoria, and they worry that it's all a brain or space occupying lesion. Um, majority of the time we find that they're physiological. Okay, a pupil size difference of two, up to two millimeters can still be normal. If everything else in your clinical history, everything else in your examination is normal, then these anisocoria can just be documented in this kind of a table. So I've given it in, uh in the example of an rapd so in in a fixed dilated pupil or something with significant damage to op the optic nerve you get a big pupil and the other side will be smaller and look the difference here is more than two okay so that's abnormal but if you examine a pupil you turn all the lights down and you're just using with a ruler to measure it in the dark and then measure it in the light look at the briskness, do a good RAPD test, and then get them to accommodate. Yeah, if you do these five things, you can generally reassure a lot of people with a slight difference in your pupils. Okay, anything like one, two millimeter with no other functional deficits can, can be fine. The two that are not fine is when you have a small pupil anatosis or a big pupil anatosis. Yeah. 
Okay, remember I said about the third nerve. If you've got a third nerve palsy and you've got a big pupil, that's a critical emergency. Okay, and then if you have a small pupil, this is the opposite. So there are three things for pupil abnormalities, three important things which are oculomotor nerve palsy, Horner's syndrome, AD syndrome. So if you've got those three things, then again, you've covered your big issues with, with pupil abnormalities. This is from X-Men, where the, the term heterochromia became um, famous, <laughs> uh, where you have the actress with a blue eye and a green eye, and this lady is a mutant and she changes her eye color on one side and, and she shows heterochromia. So Horner's syndrome can give heterochromia. Yeah, it's not the not the presenting feature, um, but it's uh, a feature that's detectable. And and if you're born with it, you may if if somebody is born with two different colored eyes, they may have congenital Horner syndrome. Just putting it there, just so that you can have something to to have in your mind. The third life threatening, the Horners. Uh, oh, I remember something about heterochromia. And what else about it? They have the opposite of the third. Instead of a big pupil, they have a tiny pupil. So the Horner syndrome, the sympathetic chain is, is disrupted. And in third nerve, the parasympathetic. In Horner's, the sympathetic, so the pupil is tiny. So you've got a myoptic pupil. You've got a ptosis, yeah, because the, the thing that lifts the eyelid is part of the third and also the sympathetic supply. So when you have no sympathetic supply, then you have no sweating. Um, the pupil and the ptosis. Okay, if you've got a Horner syndrome, that is an abnormal pupil that definitely needs to be seen. Okay, we do pharmacological testing to check uh, for the parasympathetic hypersensitivity, etc. But more importantly, we're actually looking for causes that is disrupting the sympathetic chain. So tumors of the lung, face, neck, etc. And the lymph nodes, they, they then get... Um, uh, um, x-rays, sometimes CTs, and a medical workup when you have Horner syndrome. You could be picking up a, a, a lung cancer in a patient that has new onset Horner syndrome. And then the last one is reassuring only. Um, most of the time, uh, it's an 80s pupil, and this is usually in younger women with light iridis. When you get them to constrict and look at a page and you look at their pupils, the pupil can constrict, okay? That bit of the pathway works, yeah? So they just have a slightly more dilated pupil that's more prominent in the dark. And when you see them in the slit lamp, the iris is actually moving or dancing. If you see that dancing iris and they can accommodate and it's slightly larger, maybe two millimeters, it's most likely an 80s pupil. Um, I've made quite a few of these diagnoses. They often get sent to us and the neurologists, but generally uh, we don't, we, we do pharmacological testing. So they do get outpatient appointments. Um, we only investigate them any further if there are other, other deficits like reflexes are down or any other concerns of um, hyporeactive um, states that's giving you a slightly more dilated pupil on the one side. Okay, so, and when you're looking at dilated pupils, you also want to ask about recreational drugs because sniffing cocaine, getting it up into one eye is a common potential reason for people um, coming up with a dilated pupil and it needs to be asked sensitively. And, and then you might already find out the reason why um, a particular pupil is dilated and it's a pharmacological cause. Okay, so in summary, take a careful history, do your clinical examinations, even the most worrying signs can always structure in and around your top three of each thing. Your top three of motility, your top three of pupils, your top three of swollen discs. If you, all, if you have all your top threes, like these nine things, if you could share with your colleagues that we're not fortunate enough to get onto these VIP seats today. Um, uh, you know, the slides will be made available. We, we will share our, I can email out the slides. And remember also to discuss and write orthoptics if you think that that's going to be helpful when you make an ERS referral. So just a frank papilledema, 
painful third nerve palsies, those things are immediate straight to hospital, same day, um, uh, super urgent, potentially life threatening. And then the rest, you know, um, it's, it's being careful in what you do and thorough and you should get most of this thing. The last slide I want to show you is this, which is after discussing all of these things, the most common thing you're gonna come across is a stroke, okay? Given people are living longer, a lot of people are hypertensive, a lot of Afro-Caribbean um, high blood pressure patients in your patches, in your catchment areas. So just remember fast. The facial droops, um, weakness, speech difficulty, time is critical. And this is something of, of a good poster to put in your practice, really, because we are not seeing the strokes and the heart attacks. I'm not sure what, what, what's happening to them. Everyone is so scared of COVID, they're not coming in. They're not coming into hospital and the death rate might be even higher of people dying at home. So if there is a stroke, we still want them in hospital, please. If there is a heart attacks, shortness of breath because of a cardiac, known cardiac problem, known cardiac patient, we want them in hospital, please, okay? So fast and that if it is a TIA, uh, a TIA meaning transient ischemic attack, like a mini stroke, and it usually results within the six hours and doesn't last the f more than a day, if you, in your history taking, find out that the patient has had symptoms of monocular visual loss that sound like a curtain coming down and up, if you think there has been a TIA, then you ask the GP to send them to a TIA clinic. Okay, so that is probably by far the biggest neurological thing that you commonly come across, either when you see a visual field that is homonymous hemianopia, or you see something abnormal in a color, and then you check the fields, and you find out actually they have um, a, a homonymous quadratinopia. Very, very often if you look and you check a visual field on an elderly patient and they do it well and correctly, you might find signs and symptoms of a past stroke. So that's, that's me for the main neurological things that you need to cover. I'm sorry, we're getting more and more technical problems, I guess. Um, um, all these companies are looking to start making profits <laughs> to to restrict numbers of users and stuff like that. Uh, I will probably find a slightly different way to do next week's topic because I'd like a good attendance if possible, because we're gonna go through cataracts, cataract surgery and post-ops, etc. cetera. Um, if it takes us a bit longer to sort out the, the technology, maybe it'll be in two weeks rather than next week, but keep a lookout, I'll, I'll do one more, um, one more session. Yeah, let's see. Any questions from this? Any questions from today's? Uh, yeah. Okay, sorry we couldn't get everyone in. Get everyone in. Okay. Yeah. I think so. Maybe Zoom next time and we can do a dance at the end. Yay. <laughs> the optoms and the ophthalmology has been working hard while everybody's been locked up at home. Yeah. So, so let's plan something different. I will, first of all, email the slides to Pratesh. So you have that right away. He can email that to everyone because I think this is, this is something that people worry about. So even having the slides will be useful. I will email the slides out. And then what I'll probably do is do a voiceover uh go to webinar the platform yeah maybe jess you could you could liaise with pratesh and then we could come up with something um something more formal just let me know and then um i'll i'll do the, the background work how to get the webinars for the future platforms okay so let's meet for one more uh and circulate these to your colleagues these slides to your colleagues okay sorry this topic is a little bit heavy and with our technical issues it's gone to 90 minutes again today so still okay for most of you good yeah nice to see you. nice to see you i think i only have one video feed but um good to have you all on on board 
Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Very good. I mean, this topic is always a little bit more scary and depressing and not so. You're very welcome, Jess. Uh, and and not so easy to teach with the neurological ones. But after you start seeing the patterns and you've seen one or two and and you just successfully managed a couple of these, you know, you know that you are quite well supported both by the GPs and the hospital. So don't get scared by the honey roast case or the um, papilledema scary stories that you hear. Just systematically do what you do well and you'll be fine. OK, so I'm going to say goodbye here. Thank you for putting up with all our technical issues today. <laughs> issues today uh, thanks for participating okay. okay all right see you guys soon then bye 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 bye, bye. 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 bye.